Hello and welcome to Watch It Baptist Church. My name is Mike, I'm the pastor at Watch It Baptist Church. You're visiting our online platform here on YouTube. It's great to have you with us. We're on our way through uh, the chapter in Matthew's Gospel uh, that I think really helps us see something of how the church operates, where it comes from and how it's intended to function. So we're in Matthew 16 and I'll be reading the next passage which starts at verse 13 and goes through to verse 20 in just a moment. But before we do that, let's pray together. Lord, our natural place is alongside you, under your care, inspired by you, sparked by you. Help us to occupy our natural place and to let your spirit sing in our hearts. Amen. So we're going to read this passage uh, and then we're going to have a little look at some of what it might tell us. Uh, and there's plenty that's in my head to share with you, so let's crack on. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? Jesus asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he orders his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. It's such a big deal, this passage, isn't it? I think it's one of the ones which I feel like I know uh, quite well because I've heard it read and talked about a lot over the years. We are focusing on something of what it means for the church to begin with this exchange between Jesus and Peter. Not least because Jesus says, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. And it's important that we have an understanding of what Jesus means by that rock and how the church will develop. But before we go into that, I want to mention something else. Some years ago, back in the heady days of Tesco club cards, you could do an awful lot with the vouchers that they uh, provided for you if you used their um, banking services and if you shopped in their stores. And so at some point in my family's history, we've been... Um, annual members, uh, and members of the whole year, of English Heritage, and that's why we were living in Kent. And so we would spend time at English Heritage properties in Kent, because it made for a good day out, uh, that Tesco Club Card had already paid for. So, um, we had particular castles that we visited and revisited, and one of them was Richborough. It was a Roman fort. Uh, it was uh, kind of a bridgehead when the Romans arrived um, under uh, the Emperor Claudius uh, and the sort of the, the proper invasion of the British Isles began there uh, by the Romans. Now, a little bit further down the coast um, there's Deal Castle built by Henry VIII as a defensive fortification. Uh, it has a particular shape and it looks very much like it did when it was first built. Very stark and, and stony and kind of brash and not particularly warm. A bit further down the coast is Warmer Castle which kind of has some similarities to deal but it is much warmer it has uh, sort of additional bits around it built on to make into a home and there are gardens around the castle as well it's just got a very different feel to it and then even further down the coast there's Dover Castle we'll come back to that in a little while Richborough was pretty much my favourite because it was just a whole load of open grassy space with some really ancient stone walls and lots of little sort of up and downy bits in it that the children like to hide in uh, and we would pretend that we couldn't see them. I want us to hold on to that idea of castles being a bit different and of castles that are out of use giving us a, a clue as to what their purpose was at the time and ruins as well, also giving us a sense of what came before and, and perhaps why those ruins are ruins now when they were built initially as places of significance. We'll come back to that. But in doing so, we're also going to pick up on one other thing about castles. 
which is that Roman marching forts are a different animal altogether. Roman marching forts are not found on the British Isles or anywhere else because they had a particular function and a way of operating. A marching fort was the fort that the Roman soldiers would build when they reached the end of the day's march that they could then safely rest in overnight with a guard posted on the walls and would then be taken apart the following morning before they moved on. You actually built it and then deconstructed it within 24 hours because that's what it was like to be on the move in a territory that sometimes was hostile. Okay, park all that in your brain. Let's have a quick think about the context that we bring with us as we look at these verses. First thing I want to do is have a quick look back into Matthew 15 in the first chunk of that chapter uh, where Jesus is asked by the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are particularly legalistic and, and um, structure focused, perhaps rule focused um, uh, leaders, spiritual leaders for the Jewish people in the first century in Judea. So um, they say, how dare your disciples, Jesus, how dare you those, those folks um, eat without properly ceremonially washing their hands? It's a little sidebar here. Did you do know that the reason why Nando's has hand washing sinks in it is because it was founded by a Jewish family who felt it was really important to be able to wash your hands before you ate? There you go. Um, so this is real, this sort of to and fro between Jesus and the Pharisees about what defiles somebody, what makes them unclean. And Jesus says, look, ultimately, it's not a question of whether you wash your hands first. It's a question of what's in your heart. That's what makes you unclean. How you're thinking, the things that you say and the reflection that they are of what's in your heart. That, what's, that is what makes you unclean. Also, Matthew 15 is the first little open door to the Gentiles. So a Canaanite woman comes to Jesus, or tries to get to Jesus, and appeal for his help because her daughter is unwell. And the disciples don't want to let her near, and she keeps banging on, and the disciples say to Jesus, can't you send her away properly? And Jesus goes to the woman, um, look, I, I've come for the Jews and it wouldn't be right to give to you something that's for them. And she says, hang on a minute, if you give bread to people uh, and they're eating at the table, bits fall on the floor and the dogs eat those bits of bread. So actually, even the dogs get fed when the people are fed. And Jesus goes, do you know what, fair point, your faith uh, is impressive and means something and your daughter will be well when you get home to her. So there's a little chink of a beginning of Gentile, non-Jewish, reception of uh, the good news and the kingdom and then we need to be aware that at the beginning of chapter 16 we get a couple of passages that we've looked at previously one that talks about being able to read the times what's what's the situation that you're in being able to see what's happening around you and see how god's will responds to that and the other is where jesus warns uh, as we said last time that his disciples need to be aware of the yeast of the pharisees so that kind of bringing in of a little bit of legalism and how that can spread all the way through and make a big negative impact on the whole of the loaf. Remembering, of course, that um, there's slight, probably a slightly better word is leaven and that for Passover, one of the games that was played with the children was that they would clear out all the leaven from the house. I think in modern times you still have um, kind of a, a set-up game of, of kind of a treasure hunt where bits of yeast or leaven get hidden around the house and the children have to find them all and collect them so they can all be taken out of the house so that that's... Um, leaven is removed. So there's a whole load of stuff about um, Phariseeism. Um, I can recommend a brilliant book by Gary Tyra called Defeating Phariseeism. Not easy to find, but awesome, awesome way of uh, having Matthew's Gospel particularly explained and, and a discipleship making method that challenges uh, Phariseeism being included. So we got those all as contexts for um the, 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 the keeping out of pharisaism uh, and the reading of the times as what's building into this bit so this is the bit where jesus uh, has an exchange with peter and peter says you are the messiah the son of god and jesus says yes you've got it and you've not got it from you you've got it from heaven but you've still got it and this is really important and on this will the church be built on this will i says jesus build the church so there's lots to, uh, for us to understand about Peter uh, and there's lots for us to understand about what the rock is and there's stuff to understand about Jesus too. So let's start with Peter. Jesus says that the church will be built 
on one man, on Peter. No, he doesn't. There's a little trick for you. Jesus never says that the church shall be built on somebody other than himself. He will build it himself. The building on is a way of describing how others will be involved. But the heart of the church, the essential building block, the foundation for it, remains Jesus. Jesus says he will build his church. He doesn't say Peter's going to build it. And notice that he says, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. Not on you I will build my church. So Peter is significant here, but not because of who he is. Instead, he's significant because of what he says and how he knows it. It becomes key because of what's revealed to him from heaven. You see, the rock that Jesus builds his church on isn't an individual's personality or character or their charisma or their incredible range of knowledge. Instead, what he builds the church on is the declaration that Jesus is Messiah and Son of God. It's a recognition of who Jesus is, a recognition that is revealed to Peter by the Spirit, by heaven. So Peter gets sort of caught up in this, not because of how amazing he is, but because of what he's been able to express and the significance of that expression. So what is it that Peter shows us about what the rock is? Well, let's start with this. Peter shows us that the rock is a willingness to declare that Jesus is Lord. A kind of that, that kind of bit inside him that says, I, I need to say this. This is this is what's true, this is what matters. It's also Peter's faith and his ability to listen. So we know, don't we, that faith is a gift from God, but also faith is something that we can nurture. Um, we have others around us who, if we let them, will help us with nurturing that faith. But we also can do things to sort of create a good environment within ourselves for that faith to flourish. So Peter has faith, but he also has listening. Now, the way Jesus puts this, you don't get the impression that Peter knew that it had been revealed to him by heaven. But still, he is receptive enough that when the Spirit speaks to him, he recognises what's being said. Those elements, which are in verses 16 and 17, then lead us on to other things. And I think what's, what's important here, and I recognise this isn't typically something that I do, but there's, a, there's an importance of recognising that when Jesus says, on this rock I will build my church, we then need to look at how that church is then built. So I am going to um, sort of springboard from here and look at one or two other bits and pieces. So in John 21, Peter is restored. Remember, he's, he's betrayed Jesus. He says he doesn't know who he is. Um, uh, he's never spent any time with him. He's completely detached. And the cock crows three times in that bit from the Easter story. And then in John 21, Jesus restores Peter. He says, um, he asks him three different questions. And, and when he gets to the third one, Peter suddenly is particularly aware that this is the third one. And that matches the third time that he uh, denied Jesus. But Jesus restores him and forgives him. Now Peter also then has the courage to stand up and speak. We're now into Acts 2. So at this point in Acts 2, Peter becomes like a spokesman or a front man for the church. He doesn't become its leader. He doesn't become the thing it's, it's uh, underpinned by. That's still Jesus. But he has a role. And his role at that stage is to stand up and speak. And he needs courage for that. He also needs to retain the humility and the willingness to be sent by others. At no point does Peter become sole chief in charge of the early church. In fact, in Acts 8.14, we see that he and John are sent by others to fulfil a particular role.
And then we also have in Acts, in Acts 10, a change of attitude and philosophy and requirements. See, Peter knows exactly how the church is supposed to function. He's been in it for a while. He's been a significant figure in it for a while. And the Holy Spirit again needs him to listen. And we get this amazing um, Acts 10 story of how uh, he has a vision when he's in a trance of a, of a sheep being lowered down from heaven and, and being invited to eat things, which he believes, Peter believes, to be ceremonially unclean. And, and the Spirit says, no, 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 no. What I've said is clean is clean. That's down to me and I get to choose. And you don't. So if I say it's clean, it's clean. And so what Peter then has to do is change his attitude, change his assumptions, change his requirements that for others to have before they can be part of the church and by doing so the gospel opens up to a whole new set of people so can we sum these things up well yes i think we can i think the things that make peter a rock for jesus to build on are not that he's peter but that he has a receptiveness to the spirit's voice that he has faith and he's willing to act on it and that he has courage enough to do things and think things and believe things that might otherwise be unfamiliar or uncomfortable so peter opens the way at pentecost if you think about peter's role in the church he declares uh, to jerusalem uh, in acts 4 having or is it acts 3 acts 3 having already declared in jerusalem in acts 2 that jesus is lord and was a sacrifice uh, and that this was always god's intention he reveals uh, or declares Jesus to Gentiles in Acts 10. And, and because we're in Matthew's Gospel here, it's important that we also remember that part of what Matthew is doing is building up to that final expression Jesus gives us of what it means to be a disciple, which is to disciple others. Almost you can't be a disciple unless you're also going to disciple others. Now, not everyone's going to do that the same way. Not everyone's going to have the Peter approach. But there is always going to be a need to be receptive to the Holy Spirit, to have courage, to have your assumptions challenged and changed, and to have faith that where you go, Jesus will go ahead of you. So that's the mission. From Matthew's point of view, the mission is to make disciples. And perhaps we might say that everything Peter does from the point where he declares, everything he does... Um, in order to share the good news from this point of declaration matthew 16 um, is an expression of that making disciples thing and perhaps that's what a church is a group of people who are trying to make disciples endeavoring to meet with jesus and to be obedient to him i mentioned dover castle before and one of the things i really like about dover castle is its um oh, multi-age uh building style right so there's there's a, a really old square keep. So that's a Norman age keep. And then there are various age different bits of ramparts and, and defensive works being built around it. Things that really belong to uh, the, the kind of um, medieval, post medieval, early modern period. Um, it was updated by various kings with various new bits of technology at different stages. And then eventually a massive investment is put in during the Second World War and there, is, there are tunnels under there, uh, under the castle and um, works to, to fire guns out to sea that have so little resemblance to the original Norman keep, it's unreal. Now this sense of, of sort of renewal, adaptation, upgrade stuff isn't limited to castles. Durham Cathedral has a very similar thing going on with an ancient really ancient but again a Norman basis and then various other additional bits sort of extensions and, and enlargements and new chapels and new bits of building being added on all the way through so you, as you walk through that cathedral you don't really see one building you see lots that are all sort of glued together now this isn't quite like that Roman marching camp but it does say something about the ability of those who hold a castle or a cathedral to allow it to grow, to allow it to mean something different or new or extra, to allow it to sort of pivot in the way it's structured. 
it's funny isn't it my daughter was reminding me recently that that her original parish churches were empty of pews it's just a big community space and pews got brought in by rich people who wanted somewhere to sit and they would pay for the pews to get built and then sit in them when no one else was allowed to but that original community space idea wasn't just about a place to worship it was about a big enough stone structure that it could be a shelter in storms and it could be a, um, a place of sanctuary and it could be a place to meet with God and it could be a place to meet each other. There were obviously things like inns as well, but I think churches gave a different vibe. So um, we have these changes and, and they say something about how the needs of the space change, the needs of the surrounding area change, the, the challenges facing those spaces changed as well. There's an awful lot of horse movement going around me today. I hope you're okay with that. Um, and I think I'm reasonably sheltered from the breeze, but there may occasionally be bits in the microphone that, that tell you that it's a bit breezier here than I thought it was going to be. So Jesus says he will build his church and that he will build it on a rock. And Peter shows us what that rock looks like. Faith, listening to the spirit, courage, humility, changing attitudes. Peter is no longer once we get to Acts and he's actually living out this um, role, Jesus is building a church on, um, on these factors. He's no longer that sort of dominant, shouty, um, slightly self-important, um, slightly impetuous guy anymore. You know, he's, he's still making mistakes and, and Paul, we, we see describing some of how he and Peter haven't seen things the same way. We see that in Galatians 2, 11 to 21. So Peter isn't suddenly flawless at all. Um, but he brings a lot of these characteristics and, and this faith and courage that I think is crucial for making disciples and for building a church. Peter is a rock because he obeys the call to make disciples. It's also an insistent on reading the signs of the times. He responds to, uh, maybe we see it best in Pentecost or maybe we see it best in Acts 3 or even in 4 uh, when there are different demands and, and different responses from him. But he refuses to allow the use of Phariseeism, Phariseeism to shape the church. He won't let the Pharisee attitude get built into how the church functions. He will insist on reading the times. He will focus on making disciples outside the church's home environment. And he will allow himself to be challenged by what God is doing and to challenge the authorities when he feels that they are not recognising the importance of Jesus. So Jesus builds his church on the work of the Spirit and in the lives of those who put their trust in him. And so this is where we really come to ourselves. Are you someone that Jesus can build the church on? Because remember the thing about Peter that made him special wasn't that he was Peter, it was his declaration, his ability to hear heaven's prompting, the Spirit's prompting, his ability to put his faith to work and then his humility and his courage are those things that you can bring can jesus build his church on you peter's church changed massively between this moment in matthew 16 where you might say jesus begins the church through to acts 2 and then through further to acts 10. by the time you get to the end of acts 2 they're meeting in homes presumably because there are so many of them by acts 10 they're outside Judea altogether and they're meeting people who are longing for the message of Jesus who know nothing about Jewish ways of doing things. Peter's church changed massively, it changed in personnel, it changed in size and in scope, its geography became much more massive, it changed in its attitude and Jesus kept building and still keeps building on those who will be courageous, those who will put their faith into action those who will be humble, those who will make space in their hearts for what Jesus is saying to them by his Spirit, that heaven might speak. The hospital where my uh, eldest daughter was born uh, isn't a hospital anymore, the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital uh, is what it was called at the time, it has a longer title now, uh, and it's, uh, it had itself started out as um, an amazing it's an architecturally wonderful brick structure and extra wings were put on it and then extra buildings were put on behind it and then at some point in the 20th century a big tower block was added um, really high up and it was somewhere up in that tower block uh, where my daughter was born 
but it changed. It went from being something that that looked lovely to being something that sprawled, to being something dominated by a rather ugly tower. But all the time it was seeking to provide. It was seeking to serve and heal, to educate, to prepare, to take care of people, to provide employment for others. That hospital didn't really stand still. It didn't look the same when it was knocked down. Not all of it was knocked down, but most of it was. It didn't look the same in any way as it had when it started. And in the end, they did knock it down and they built something purpose-built a little bit further out of the city. With that, and with Dover Castle, and with Durham Cathedral, we're looking at something that evolves because the world around it changes. In Peter's church, we see how it evolves as it goes from where Jesus began by saying, on this rock, I will build my church, through to the multicultural, multinational, international um, wonder that is the church today in many languages and with many different ways of worshipping and you know all the way from marvelous outdoor spaces in Africa where thousands of people join together to sing all the way through to underground churches in places where you can't sing and you can't declare uh, and persecution is just around the corner and, and informant, informants will pull the church apart. So what about our church? What about us in this place at this time, wherever you are? Does Jesus build our church? And can he? Because it would seem from this example, and I want to be careful that we don't take an entire bit of doctrine from one verse, but it does seem from this example that where Jesus builds his church, he builds it on those who are willing. On those who are willing to hear the Spirit's voice. On those who are willing to put their faith on the line. On those who are prepared to bring humility and courage to the world around them and the disciples around them. So how do I become a rock for that? How do you become a rock for that? And what does it mean for us as a local expression of Jesus? Because that's what I think a church really is. It's a community that expresses Jesus. It's the body of Christ. What do we expect the local church to be? What are the essential building blocks of it? Where do we start? Communion? Praying together, sung worship, mission, discipling one another to spiritual growth, good doctrine, a place of safety, a place of encouragement. What are the key principles? And why are they the key principles? And how do they reflect the rock on which Jesus says he would build his church? Is there space for seeking Jesus in different ways? Do we have the faith and the courage and the humility and the spiritual listening to be doing what God is asking us to do? Lord Jesus, we want you to build your church. It will only be good if you build it. Hear our hearts in these few moments as we put ourselves in your care so that we might grow to be the rock you can build your church on. Hear our hearts in these few moments. Hear us, Lord, we pray. Amen. Right then, three questions as is usual. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we stick a fourth one in just to keep it interesting. Question one, do you want the local church, the church where you are, to be more like Richborough Roman Castle with its undulating grass and its ancient walls? Would you rather it was more like the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital? Changing and adding and building and expanding and going up and looking ugly sometimes, but still providing. Do you want it to be more like Deal Castle? 
a, a well-established keep. Stark, clear, uncluttered, and perhaps, um, perhaps a little bit further away from the sea than it was originally intended to defend. Maybe you'd like the church to be more like a marching camp where it arrives in a place, sets up, and then when it's done in that place, deconstructed and taken away again. Which of those four, or maybe something else, do you want church to be like? Question two, how can we help each other to hear the voice of the Spirit, the voice of heaven, and to grow in faith and courage and humility? How can we help each other to do those things? Question three, are we doing what the Spirit is calling us to do as a local church? And question four, are we expectant enough that Jesus really will build his church? Well, that's it from me. I ask, perhaps, that in addition to looking at those questions, you might go away praying that you would be a rock on which Jesus can build his church. And I look forward to talking with all of you about what it means to be part of how Jesus built his church. Take good care. I hope to see you soon. God bless.